Hello, everyone, and welcome back to uh, the next session in Petroleum Economists LNG to Power Forum for North America. Quick reminder before we get going on this session that uh, if you want to interact with the panel, and we do encourage you to do so, you can ask questions or make comments by uh, using the chat button on your screen, which should open up a pane to the right hand side where you can see your question and those that uh, have been posed by others. Uh, we've spent a lot of time today discussing markets, decarbonisation, the role of gas stroke LNG in the en energy transition. What we haven't talked about much so far is the role of technology in opening up new LNG markets. Uh, a good example of that kind of technology is the development of the FSRU, which if my memory serves correctly, uh, we saw the first one start operation in 2005, so 15 years. However, uh, if you analyze the countries that have developed such projects, they tended to work well or work most easily in countries that already have established gas markets. Uh, it's proved to be quite tricky to open up a brand new market, even with an FSIU. So we now have a panel discussion that will focus on investing in optimal LNG import infrastructure with a particular emphasis on small scale markets in the Western Hemisphere. Our moderator for this session is uh, Perry Connell, LNG Infrastructure Manager at ExxonMobil. So Perry, over to you. Thanks, Alex. And thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Um, we've got a we've got a fun fun panel here and I'm going to take uh, take Alex's introduction. We're going to talk a little bit more about bringing energy, uh, gas based energy to some of these smaller emerging markets uh, and with a focus on um, is it smaller scale? Is it micro scale? That's going to be a question. So uh, Don Hubbard is joining us from Hygo Energy Transitions, um, a company uh, renowned with uh, with FSRUs. And we're going to work our way down into to Callum McClure, who's Cryopeak company. Uh, Callum is CEO of Cryopeak, is in the Pacific Northwest in British Columbia, end-to-end -end value chain. And Jill Ivanko, um, representing Chart Industries, CEO, Thank you all for joining us. Uh, so we've got a neat niche of folks who are enabling this this kind of new segment of the LNG space. I shouldn't say new. I think there's folks in there who are doing a good, doing a great job for it. But we said small scale. They said micro scale. Um, let me let me start off the question and throw this to Jill and maybe Callum. What do you? How do you define scale in LNG? Is it uh, conventional, small, micro? Help me understand where you draw the lines. In ExxonMobil, uh, you know, we these folks debate it left and right, and I think I hear others too. What do you, what do you think? Sure, I'll, I'll get started, and then I'll pass it to um, Callum, who will talk in more detail on the micro scale side of things. Um, the way that we think about the various different scales is really threefold. Um, the amount of power generation that's needed, the storage requirements, and the plot or the land size that you have to work with. Um, when you, we look at conventional scale, we're talking about power that's a greater than 100 megawatts, and this usually requires on-site erected storage tanks, quite a bit of underground work. And frankly, we're seeing conventional scale less and less, um, in particular in North America. So kind of moving down from that base load into that modular mid-scale side of things, um, the, the mid-scale, you know, we think of again, five to 100 megawatt type of power generation sizes. And these can be you know, 0.25 MTPA up to kind of two MTPA size trains and producing those. Seeing that more and more, but frankly, I think where um, moving into the small scale and micro scale is kind of the future of LNG in particular in North America. Um, and these go to being very modular, uh, very flexible. Um, typically, you know, you see them in, historically you've seen them in more remote locations, um, but the capability and the flexibility around small scale and micro scale is, is pretty, um, pretty extreme compared to what you have uh, to a conventional scale type of project. Um, so we at Chart, you know, serve all of these various different um, aspects of the LNG sizes with our equipment. But um, we would view Callum's company at Cryopeak as uh, one of the leaders in the micro scale area. So let's turn it over to him to kind of chat a little bit more into that niche. 
Yeah, great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jill. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're certainly involved in uh, small scale. When we we started about eight years ago, uh, we always saw we were going into small scale. So either small scale got bigger and became, and we got involved with micro scale, or it's a new <laughs> a new way of looking at it. The way I sort of see it is uh, units are often a good way to look at it. If you're talking of uh, 100,000 cubic meters of shipping, then to me that's conventional. Million tons per annum is conventional, whether that's export, conventional regas, uh, import. We're seeing on the small scale side, when it's truck, that's definitely micro scale. And we're, we're talking then really in terms of gallons, whether that's production volume, uh, transportation volume. Um, and so that's how I would see truckload is definitely small scale. Um, whether you call it micro scale. And then we're seeing an, a, an interesting emerging market of uh, either smaller conventional scale or larger small, uh, larger micro scale, which is the bunkering industry uh, where you've got parcel sizes maybe of 10,000 cubic meters uh, and, and around that sort of mark. So that's how I would be at Perry. Okay. I think uh, one of the, the matter, one of the ways I've differentiated internally has been what is the further aggregation uh, or, or sub-aggregation that takes place? And uh, feels like um, maybe small scale, I'll call it small scale, a 10,000 or 20,000, as you mentioned, could possibly go to a couple of different micro scale customers. But perhaps maybe once you put it on a container or once you put it on a tank, it's probably tough to break it into multiple customers, but I bet you guys could figure it out if, if, if it could be done. Um, uh, so shifting over to, to Don, so the FSRU can, can meet the needs of lots of customers, uh, or one, depending upon the case. Um, do you, let me ask you this question. It's been asked, asked to me, how small is too small for an FSRU? Does the small scale space, does that work for a typical FSRU? Uh, historically, the, the way I've looked at these is you get to around 300 megawatts and, and you start to see a really substantial impact on uh, on the OPEX for these terminals. So you have to really start looking very carefully. And to Jill's point, uh, each of these projects is unique and you have to look at the profile of the specific project to determine what's the right solution, whether it's an, uh, an FSRU or uh, barge-based regas like we were seeing in Colombia briefly and uh, you know down to the micro size so uh, you know the way HIGO looks at it is they're saying uh, we have a 50 percent partner Golar who began its life as a small-scale LNG shipper and so what their goal is is to bring the full solution to the table and say don't think of just purely onshore or purely charter but think of everything in between. Think of how you can structure the use of an FSRU or an FSU for either an interim or a permanent solution and uh, dispense with all or some of the OPEX uh, and invest directly in the terminal. So they want to be owners in the terminals so they can bring all those assets to the table and change the way uh, you, we think of these terminals and, and not just, am I going to charter a vessel or will I own onshore assets? I think uh, uh, Jill's point is really important to, to think about the different aspects of this. So we do a bottoms up analysis. You look at the market that the power is selling, uh, selling into and you understand where that power plant's gonna reside on the, on the supply stack and what their gas consumption rates are going to be. And then you look at and see whether you're also complementing that LNG to power terminal with uh, truck loading operations so that you can pursue a micro scale operation to complement it out and leverage those same assets. And the picture starts to change as to where you can accommodate LNG to power with an FSRU when you have those complementary businesses, uh, micro LNG businesses to support transportation, industrial and commercial off takers uh, and, and users like that. So, you know, I think it's changing because uh, Terminal owners and investors like HIGO are looking at business models differently now and thinking about how do they how do they change it either onshore or floating to something that's more practical that meets the needs of the unique profile of each project. So I think that that number is coming down and can come down dramatically. 
and the more you complement the LNG to power business with micro uh, micro scale LNG or small scale LNGs, LNG operations from that to distribute gas to other uh, locations, then you have a very different picture, and, and that that number can come down pretty significantly. That's a uh, let's come let's come back to that, Don, uh, because that then might change the approach that one takes towards developing the project, and the approach that the host government, the countries, the regulators need to take towards how do they bring gas fairly and gas to power fairly into their country. Um, so a lot of storage on an FSRU and in going into the, whether we call it small or micro scale or these, these smaller grades. Um, but when we, storage tends to be one of the more expensive, perhaps the most expensive part of the, of the LNG uh, chain. Uh, Callum, when you're, you're moving uh, your end-to-end -end -end integrated chain. How important is storage uh, for you and for, for your customers? And is it, are you wrestling with little bits, hundreds of cubic meters, an extra tank here or there, or an extra ISO tank here or there, or are, do customers need the assurances that come with tens of thousands of cubic, cubic meters? Yeah, I think Don had a very uh, important point that every customer is unique um, in their power uh, when you're looking at, say, for a power application. Um, first question would be looking at whether they're solely dependent on natural gas or whether they they have options for fuel flexibility. And obviously, if it's 100% reliant on natural gas, then there's going to be storage volumes that are needed, a number of days of uh, product storage at site, whereas if there's flexibility, LNG storage may be reduced somewhat. Um, so you have to look at every customer in particular. Uh, where we operate up in the northwest of Canada, we, um, in our sort of northern northern fuels business, uh, we do a lot of primarily road transportation. Um, so we have very uh, have a very keen focus on the logistics and actually reducing some of the on-site storage. So typically with diesel, a mine might have say had 14 days storage at a mine site. They might only have four days of five days of storage with LNG. It means that the logistics are really critical. We have a very sort of strong focus to make sure that they uh, they've always got gas available, and and the logistics becomes really really critical. So each customer is uh, unique when it's road based distribution. Uh, you're really talking about the hundreds of cubic meters of uh, storage for for most applications. Um, obviously, when it's um, marine or um, other forms of logistics, then the volumes get bigger. So it sounds like your 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 value chain is integral to them realizing security of supply and being able to reduce the amount of cryogenic storage uh, because of so the two of you, your customer and you, a supplier, are working together uh, to deliver the best solution. That's um, correct. Yeah. The most optimal solution. Uh, it's tough to tough to put that into a tender, I imagine. Um, so it must take some uh, careful work with with customers. Yeah, a lot a lot of planning, um, and and typically where we're operating, um, the far northern parts of Canada in the in the winter. It, last winter it was actually colder than Mars up in uh, one of the mines we operate, and uh, minus fifty three degrees Celsius. Um, and so we're, we're very remote. We're up the Alaska Highway. We've got single road access. So the logistics and managing the security of su supply. And actually, the mining question is a gas only facility. It doesn't actually have any other fuels to generate power. So the criticality of ensuring that and making sure they've got gas all the time whenever that, that's required is really important. And it's a, it's a, and we've had, but we've had great, great success with that. J Jill, on, on that uh, on that wavelength, and I've I've worked with some of your team before, and they're they're great at helping you figure out how much storage you, the customer, need or would benefit from. Um, how do you how 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 do you deal with that with customers um, and get that trust where you're steering them towards what might seem like a a slim storage solution, uh, let's say compared to a traditional liquid fuel or something else. Sure, sure. And um, I'll just keep going with the theme that we've come up with for this one, uh, which is unique. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I think, yeah, similar to what both Don and Callum have described is you have to really understand what the requirements are and 
you know, each individual situation is very different, which it, our approach is to have kind of this flexible suite of equipment and in particular related to storage. Um, we've seen quite an increase recently, even in the last six months around ISO container storage. And you know, for back to the three things that the decisions kind of made around in terms of conventional down to micro scale, Similarly, on the ISO container side um, and storage in particular, you're really looking around size, uh, pressure, and then the types of unique capabilities that any one particular customer would want. Um, what we have seen quite a bit uh, recently is a desire for something a little more standard. So um, you go back to kind of the two fundamental um, discussion points in any power discussion, and it's cost and scale or cost and infrastructure. And when you're talking about cost, you know, the, the smaller the scale, the more cost effective you can become in terms of from the moment you start designing till first gas. And the same goes around kind of the ISO container and the storage side, the more standardized you can make sizes and the more standard you can have these fit to other uh, pieces of complementary equipment, the, the better off you're going to be from a cost perspective. But again, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's unique to each individual situation. Do you, do you find that there's a, a practical limit on the amount of ISO container based storage or type C based storage for a site? I mean, I realize you could make it the size of Texas, but um, <laughs> for our, for our audience, yeah. is there kind of like a, if you guys found a practical limit? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's storage and throughput um, size and, and throughput that you're looking yeah. for, but um, practically speaking, you know, we, we tend to see kind of the seven to eight days of storage is um, the right sizing. And that goes a little more toward what Callum was talking about where you get higher into kind of that thousand cubic meter versus just a few hundred. Um, and yeah, I think the other piece to one of your earlier comments, Perry on um, around how do you take something and maybe handle more than one customer? Um, and that can really go into how from the value chain, the transport, the size of the containers and where they are along any particular um, structure or plot design um, can make a difference on how you handle one or many customers. Yeah. Inventory management is a, is a critical aspect. Next to logistics, it's probably one of the most critical aspects of these of these projects and uh, like I said we what HIGO what I have historically done and what we're implementing uh, for HIGO is that bottoms up analysis know your gas consumption rates understand the impact of seasonality uh, the impact of weather conditions understand what your storage uh, containers are going to look like you may have a, a site where geotechnical studies say you can't put a big old tank there you have to think differently Okay, so there are a lot of things that are going to affect what that storage looks like. Um, and, and then you, you build all that up, you understand what your design is on your, uh, on your terminal, you run a discrete event simulation, which you know, we've used Lanner to do that, and you run through uh, hundreds of scenarios and look at what's going to happen when you have the impact of, of weather, of different size delivery vessels, the cargoes they're offloading, what your boil off gas management system is, what your vaporization send out, uh, send out rate is, and match all that up with your consumption, downstream gas consumption rates, including all of the, the micro LNG, the truckload operations in addition to power. And then you, you come up with a few data points from those simulations to, to say, okay, here are our trade-offs. And then you make decisions based on that, but you, you the the output from those, that modeling tells you at a certain point, you start to run up against uh, inventory that's just too high in your tank. So you have to make some adjustments elsewhere. And, and so you, you really need to understand that. So you don't end up with demurrage events or failure to take events uh, or not having enough and being able to meet your downstream customer's demand. So it's, it's a very complicated, process and uh, you know your, your goal is as Jill and, and Callum were both saying is you've got to look at inventory management and understand exactly what the needs are downstream and and design so you don't over design or under design your project yeah I mean to to give you kind of an extent of what Don's saying on the simulation side of things 
Um, we, when we're in upfront engineering uh, timing, we typically will run 150 to 200 simulations um, on any one particular site or project. Wow, impressive. Um, yeah, so and I, we're on 150 to 200, that's uh, not uncommon to run that kind of number of scenarios. Um, I, I lost a few years of my life to running simulations for uh, a certain very large, large Middle Eastern country, uh, but that was not small scale, micro scale, you couldn't even use those words there. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, so we've, we've seen on the, on the FSRU side and the conventional uh, project side, um, uh, large, large capital investments, whether it's obviously with the FSRU, but also with the tanks and the berths, uh, the pipelines that can get into hundreds of millions. Uh, on the, but when we're talking about customers that are in that I don't know, call it sub 200, sub 300 megawatt uh, range, where are we, what, are, what does, what do the bankable small scale or micro scale solutions look like? Don, are these, um, when you're, when you're building them on top of an, an existing FSRU project, is it, does bankability matter that much? Uh, is it more of a, a, I don't want to call it a private matter, but a bilateral matter with the new customers? And Callum, I'm curious if in your space where you're putting micro scale into, into new customers and that is the whole chain, is, does bank, how does bankability play in and financeability? Don, I don't yeah. know if you want to. Don, do you want to go first? Or Don't one of y'all. <laughs> yeah, from our, from our perspective, when it's uh, on, the, on the micro scale customers, I mean, there's a couple of key things. Um, the, the customer is important. They have um, capital that's at their particular site. Um, we see the customers could be, could be different in the Northwest. Typically they are uh, either industrial customers like the mining industry, um, or they could be municipalities where they've got power generation requirements um, for, their, for their town, such as Whitehorse as an example. Um, we focus on for when it's, uh, a mine, they can be, they may not have 20 plus years mine life. It might be a, a five year mine life where we have to look at solutions that are much more redeployable. Um, we would focus on st standardized uh, equipment solutions, which we can redeploy and reuse for other, for other uh, customers in the, in the future. Um, we do, and, and so that's really one of the sort of key things. So one of the when we look at our northern business, we have uh, customer sites where we've got uh, standard redeployable uh, equipment solutions, as well as providing two permanent multi-year uh, decades of uh, storage that have been designed for the long term. So it's quite un un unique and again, goes back to each customer is different. Uh, they have different needs and, uh, and we have to look at all of the unique aspects of that particular customer. Yeah. Doing a project entirely on balance sheet is not, uh, or with equity financing, is not often very attractive you, unless you have plans to recapitalize that project. But I mean, the banks, we've, we've all worked with the banks and we know what they look for. They want to see uh, offtake contracts that are going to exceed uh, the, the tenor of the, of the loan. They want to see they get paid back a couple of years early. Uh, you know, they want to see all the typical things. They want to see matching supply and offtake agreements. They want to see no risk and uh, commodity risk for the project. Um, they prefer to see uh, an LNG to power where you're dealing with one big offtaker, whether it's a local distribution company um, or, or whoever it might be. But um, they're not averse to working with multiple off-takers. They'll just want to look down at the credit worthiness of each of those and do they need to have credit enhancement instruments behind them. Uh, they're going to look at all of these kinds of risk elements and the more downstream off-takers you have, a little more complicated it gets for the banks and the more they're going to look at it uh, you know, really closely. So I think you, know, you want to be sure that your, your documents, your agreements all go back to back and you're limiting your commodity exposure and uh, um, just your, your execution risk as well. Do the, um, the, we talk about ISO containers, tank trucks, um, expensive pieces of equipment. Uh, how, do, how do lenders see them 
with uh, with on the on the customer side. And the customer is looking to to get gas, have a gas to power scenario going on. Are the are those transient assets like tanks and trucks expensive? Do they get do they get financed by the customer, or is that more of a service provider's uh, role? Thus, kind of bringing in a different kind of financing arrangement. Uh, Don or Callum or Jill, if you have it. <laughs> um, oh, I'll chime in since it's a, it's not our traditional business, but um, yeah, our, we we want to sell you equipment and move on. <laughs> but yeah, you know, when we're, you're really looking at the industry itself. Um, it, it's kind of been a shift, I think, over the last couple of years away from what you would say is kind of a traditional wrap of a project with an EPC um, to more of the owner operator responsibility. Um, I think Don hit the nail on the head when he talked about the matching of, you know, offtake with expense and, you know, how does that work? So um, there's a, a pretty big movement toward continuing to find efficiencies in the ways that these are built, whether it's upfront capital cost or ongoing OPEX, um, to try to help contribute to um, achieving financing. Um, and, you know, I, I think the other piece of the puzzle here is there's more and more um, creative financing happening in the industry, and that goes all the way through the, the supply base and, and the vendor chain. And I think in order to continue to remain competitive, um, we're going to have to we're going to have to keep finding ways to do that. So get out of kind of the traditional um, financing mentality and, and figure out ways to shorten engineering to production, and also you know how financing can happen uh, more in the private sector. And then from from our side on the on the tank truck tankers and the uh, distribution equipment. Really, I think we have to look at it more of a our northern region, like the Pacific Northwest, and 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 what's the right sizing of the fleet? Um, what's the the most attractive uh, fleet for that particular region? So, for example, in Canada, we have very heavy weight rules for the road compared to the U.S. So we can run combination trailers, which is really attractive when we're lowering the delivered price of or the delivered cost of LNG to a customer site. But you wouldn't build out your entire fleet with that based on the customers that are there. You have to look at it and right size the fleet as, and it's very similar in a way, I suppose, probably to the uh, larger uh, players in the LNG industry that would right size their control fleet of chips that would distribute their fuel to their customers. So on a micro scale, we have to look at it in a similar type of way where uh, we've got, and, and, and the, the trailers uh, and equipment is, generally least financeable from banks. You have to show that you've got a, a sound business and a good business plan, um, but there is uh, financing options um, available um, based on the health of obviously the, the company operating. So so moving uh, kind of akin to how we do with LNG carriers now in, in the chain, uh, sounds like. Uh, super, thank you. Let's maybe shift gears a little bit and talk about where are the, uh, you know, where are the growth markets in this in this space? Um, I've, I'll, I'll tell you, in my head, working for ExxonMobil, looking at LNG that's going on ships and moving across oceans, uh, maybe in some case seas. Um, but uh, it's it's really interesting talking with you, Callum, and learning about how successful your company has been in in just the Northwest. Are you guys looking to branch out into other markets? Um, and where do you see where do you see growth that can take your uh, kind of integrated chain model? Yeah, no, that, there's, that's a great uh, question. First of all, in the Pacific Northwest, we still see a lot of opportunity for gas. Um, we, uh, one of the things that LNG or gas is always put vis-a-vis -vis other fuels and you always get, there's a sort of 20% uh, benefit from cons consumption on a one-for-one -one basis. One thing that's often overlooked is the ability to use natural gas as a heating medium and where you get very high rates of heating efficiency. So there's a big avoidance of, uh, so if, if you took uh, some of the municipalities in Northern Canada, you could actually reduce the amount of fuel you need to burn to create power to then provide electric heat. So we do see there's an opportunity for gas to be used more extensively as a heating fuel to reduce 
and avoid diesel consumption or other fossil fuel consumption in the north. That, that's definitely an area of growth that we can see. Um, also, we've been at the business for uh, eight years now, and uh, it's been a very um, interesting evolution of how the market's evolved. And we think we've got a really good um, operating experience and solutions that we can provide customers. So we're, we're interested to develop uh, regions uh, with other partners uh, on a broader basis than Canada. And that might be within North America, looking at Caribbean options um, and, and the like. So we're evaluating that at the moment. It would be very much a partnership model to collaborate and uh, try and leverage what we've, we've, we, we, we know and have achieved up here in Canada. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I think so much when I think of this hemisphere, I think of the Caribbean and, and Central America as, as being a, a growth area uh, for these kinds of sizes. Don, uh, where, where's your, what's, uh, where, where's HIGO on this? And do you have any, given that your view is largely kind of, I get a sense, leading with the FSRU and then enabling, using the FSRU model to enable some of these uh, smaller customers through micro, micro scale is, I haven't, it seems like that globally, that has been kind of slow for a lot of these new projects to kind of pick up these, um, these micro scale customers. Yet I hear folks screaming for the LNG and, and Jill's team can, can build tanks and build ISO containers super fast. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Uh, Hygo's strategy is really much broader than that. It, it's to say well, Hygo owns a large part of the logistics chain and what they're bringing is optionality to, to coming up with creative business models to support delivery of LNG into different markets where historically it just hasn't been, uh, been adapted because the economics didn't support the traditional big old FSRU and you know, all that whole process. So they're, they're investing in uh, the terminal, whether it's an onshore, whether it's uh, floating, or uh, there are instances in South America where HIGO is developing leading with the small scale LNG solution oh. and power will follow. And uh, I think we're, we're actually working with, uh, uh, with chart equipment uh, in the design for one of these projects. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that this has been the evolution of the industry that's been waiting to happen. And I recall participating in this conference a year ago and, and looking out at the audience and just saying that the producers have to think of the markets differently now. You're not going to, you're going to go stand in a line, get in a queue behind everybody else trying to sell LNG supply to one of these big balance sheet investment grade off takers. That's a finite pool of off takers. So you have to think of these model, these uh, business opportunities differently. And then companies like uh, HIGO have to work with CryoPeak and Chart and figure out how do we integrate different business models into one platform and leverage the assets effectively and, and generate uh, good, attractive returns. But that's helping to penetrate markets that have historically been left un, unattended. You're kind of, uh, you're changing the paradigm on the chicken egg. Um, is it the big one that makes the small one possible? No, maybe it's a small one that makes the big one possible. That's uh, that's that's insightful. Jill, any thoughts on where the where do you see the growth in this these scales that we speak of? Yeah, I think Don covered it very well in terms of the paradigm shift, and we're certainly seeing that as well. Um, I think the one area we've seen the. the fastest growth most recently has been in ISO containers from an equipment perspective. And that I think really goes to exactly what Don's saying, where you have to have a level of flexibility and you have to be able to handle differing conditions. Uh, you have to be able to cut down on um, transferring of liquid or gas. Um, so the fewer touch points that there are, but ease of handling and the various different modes of transportation, I think that's gonna continue to um, get a foothold around the world, not just in, in North and South America. Um, but I, I also think the other area um, of growth on the horizon here relates to kind of technology development and continuing to make this uh, one of the most competitive power sources. And how do you do that? Um, the only way you can do that is you continue to evolve to make these uh, facilities and the processes associated with them uh, much more efficient. And then, you know, we could spend 
stays on the carbon neutrality discussion, <laughs> but simply from a, from a growth perspective, you know, around that modularity. Jill, you 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 mentioned that there's been a lot more uh, attention on ISO containers. Um, is and as a bit of an outsider, I've been watching what appears to be the costs coming down. Um, I guess I've got two questions: is is the ISO container is it what's the trend on it? Is there is there more of a technology gain there? Is there likely costs going to come down? And if that's okay, depending on where that's going to go, is there a chance that ISO containers start going um, inter-country, not intra-country, but go on a ship and move from country to country in in mass, not not necessarily opportunistic, but full value chains enabled by that? Yeah, I definitely think um, to to the latter part of your question, that is that is we will see that um, we're yeah. starting to see it already um, around the trends in this the space itself. It's really um, I'll go back to you know, shoot me for this, but the word unique, you know, it's it's project by project and what everybody's looking for. But we are seeing um, actually a move toward larger ISOs, um, so that's one element. Um, there's also the desire for. Um, ISO flexibility in terms of can you move these between sites? So if you're starting at site one, uh, but ultimately you're gonna have a network of uh, small scale locations, can these be utilized in more than one location? Um, and then to the cost part of your question, uh, you know, the, way, the way that we're working on lower, lower costs, frankly, is by manufacturing these, some of our lower cost shops, and those would be India and China, and then figuring out how to have that network of availability and where they're stored so that you have that quick lead time. Because again, you know, the, the shorter you can go from decision or FID, for lack of a better term, to um, being in production, the better off the operator is gonna be. Yes, sometimes I think of what the growth potential could be in this. And it, I, I think of like the world being full of like the standard containers like we see, except no, 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 these are ISO containers. These aren't like <laughs> a bit more expensive and a bit more complicated. And uh, Correct. Uh, I don't wanna see them sitting in a field somewhere rusting and then going back on a ship. <laughs> but um, that's, uh, there's, it, I don't know if uh, Callum, if, if that's uh, kind of mass movement of ISO containers, is something uh, via Marine is something that you guys have looked at? Yeah, we've actually, uh, we, we've done some pilot projects before with, uh, we shipped 20 uh, tanks to China. Um, there was uh, from uh, Vancouver, West Coast. Um, there was, um, the, the, the goal was uh, taking uh, ISO tanks direct to the point of consumption versus securing gas from uh, import facilities on a break bulk sort of basis. So, and I, I think at that time there was just a lack of availability of uh, LNG that drove that particular project. Um, so it definitely happens, and there's there's definitely a that definitely a viable uh, and very and, and there's a there's a number of projects in Canada certainly looking at intermodal use of ISO, ISO tanks for marine uh, for the where they. For, for the northwest where we've got road access, then they uh, then then we prefer tankers because it all boils down to maximizing the payload and and if you've got a very utilized uh, road tanker, you're 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 squeezing every uh, unit you can into that particular trailer to minimize the distribution cost. So it's again, it's uh, depends on the the type of uh, trade and the logistics that are required. Okay. Well, we're we're uh, we're running running out of time. Um, I had uh, man, I thought I had some polls out there, but I can't even figure out how to use them anymore. So I'm gonna have to get gonna have to get better at that. Um, it, I guess my last thought, and maybe each of you can share something on this: uh, regulations and the regulatory uh, framework in this space. I think you we've got aspects of of containers, the containers themselves, the movement of containers through. Uh, highway, marine highways, rail, um, as well as the uniqueness of this smaller, the smaller scale and coming with custom solutions in a world where uh, power auctions and government tenders that are very geared towards one particular solution. What do, what do regulators need to realize or how can they help um, 
consumers? How can they help consumers and help suppliers, frankly, uh, meet and be successful in this micro scale space? Small micro scale. Uh, Don, you want to, or, uh, or any of you want to jump in? Uh, or I have to start dancing. It depends on <laughs> where in the Western Hemisphere you are. So in the United States, there's a, a pretty solid understanding among the regulators as to how this industry works. But you get into the Caribbean and Central America and South America, not so the case. And I think an education process on how these terminals operate can help, it can facilitate rational, well thought out regulations rather than impulsive reaction to uh, to situations. And one I'll speak of in particular is what one country where there is a regulatory requirement to have eight days of supply in a tank. Now it's creating all kinds of issues on inventory management and how you design and where you you're almost forced into over designing the terminal because of that regulation. So things like that really help uh, help to help them understand how these terminals function uh, will facilitate good regulatory frameworks that we can all operate in. Fantastic. Jill, Callum, thoughts? From, from our side, uh, one of the big advancements up in Canada was they, uh, we developed a section of the CSA code, the Canadian Standards Code, very similar to the NFPA code, which addressed small scale facilities. And it took a lot of deterministic and gray out of how they're designed. It was very prescriptive and it was really beneficial because it allows, uh, it was, it, and it was a good initiative. So uh, we've got good re regulations, certainly in North America. And um, if they can be used in other jurisdictions, that's probably a good thing. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just conclude by bringing both Don's and Callum's comments together. And uh, I think probably the biggest challenge is that a lot of regulations and certifications are country um, or in the best case continent specific, and that creates um, more costs associated with projects. So I think having thoughtful, I'm not saying to get rid of regulations or certifications, that's a problem, but you know, there's there's a very fine line of how those work and how can they work together and how restrictive um, does that make your project and what that timeline looks like associated with it. Okay, well, I think we've, uh, I think we're hitting the end of our time commitment here. And I actually, I think the poll that I put out there, actually people have responded to it. I'm just apparently computer illiterate and can't figure out how to, I don't know, glean insights from it, but I'll take some homework and I'll send it to everybody on LinkedIn. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jill, Callum, Don, uh, for, for joining us today. It's been an insightful uh, discussion. I've heard, uh, I've heard unique. I've heard that, well, one guy's small is another guy's micro, and actually one guy's micro is another guy's conventional. So <laughs> <I do. laughs> it's uh, so there's maybe not exactly agreement on that, but it's the the specialized nature and the customer to the important customer to supplier uh, nature of this segment. Um, it's not a commoditized segment, uh, and I think that. Uh, participants need to understand that and regulators as well. So um, thank you again for, uh, for joining us.